Hello, my name is Dr. Brian Riley, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to look at the following videos of our EE capstone class for the past year, 2012, at Ohio University. And what you'll see are students that have been working on projects that allow them to have a major design experience in the area of electrical engineering. Our students work in teams of four to five individuals where they've taken on projects uh, in the area of robotics, allowing them to develop flight control algorithms, uh, work with hovercraft to be able to design algorithms and show the capability of being able to uh, harvest power from a power line, to projects such as FAA collision avoidance, where students here have worked on a project using ultrasonic sensors and developed an algorithm that will allow the aircraft to determine when it may be in proximity to a stationary object or something that it should not collide with. The students have worked throughout the entire academic year to complete these projects, and so what you'll see are the final results of the projects that I've just described. So again, we thank you for taking the opportunity to review the projects that our students have worked so diligently to accomplish. I'm Daniel Shapiro, and these are my associates, David Edwards and Evan Jolly. Uh, together, we are the Ohio University Integrated Health Management System uh, Capstone Design Project. Uh, our project is the fourth iteration uh, of our title, and it's a joint project between the College of Engineering and the Ohio University uh, Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. The main aspect of our project is improving community health through the deployment of integrated health management systems, or as we like to shorten it to, kiosks. You may have seen these in uh, different drug stores, local campus locations, or other businesses around the area. They are essentially scales and blood pressure cuff systems that measure different metrics of health and display it back to users. Uh, we were tasked with improving the designs by adding extra features and trying to reduce the cost through developing alternative hardware. Uh, my main aspect of the project was the development of alternative hardware. One of the big things that we've done this year is design a prototype scale that costs a significantly less uh, or lower amount of money to deploy than the current commercial designs, which range from anywhere to $800 to $1,000. Um, my part of the project was basically to take uh, the scale from last year, which outputted uh, the weight of the user in a hexadecimal format uh, to a screen that was on the scale itself. And my job was to take that and make it so that it would communicate with a PC where it would transmit the weight of the user to the PC where it could later be integrated into a kiosk or something similar. Um, we also worked on calibrating the scale and we made a calibration function that would take uh, the best fit line of the weights on each individual feet and would add them up and send them to the display on the PC. The final part of the project was the software side of the interface. They wanted us to add new features and make it flow better. To do this, we the biggest feature they wanted was a database feature, which we created by creating a database that would store all vital health metrics and that a user could then retrieve later. This, with this, we integrated a chart and a graphing function uh, to make it easier for a user to communicate their data. We also simplified the interface such that a user can more easily go through a checkup. Hello, we're the TurtleBot team. I'm Sarah Scheitower. This is Faye Fan, Joe Barlack, and Samantha Craig. Um, as you can see over here is the TurtleBot. It came as a commercial platform with the base as the Roomba. Um, it came with the Xbox Connect and a netbook. And we modified it to be a search and rescue robot to navigate a predefined path and find a victim. And Faye is going to talk more about the sensors that we use to do that. Actually, we use three types of sensors. Uh, one is the temperature sensor and the CO2 sensor and the Xbox Connect. And uh, for the temperature sensor, we can detect the environmental temperature, and we also set the threshold for that to be uh, 60 centigrade. And if it's above the 60 centigrade, it will keep the turtle uh, away from a hot place. And the CO2 sensor can sense the human CO2 emission, and so we can recognize there is a human out there as a victim. And uh, Xbox Kinect can do the navigation part, which is Joe can talk about it. All right, 
I'll talk a little bit about the Xbox Connect Center. Uh, the main thing we use it for is for navigation. We create a SLAM map, which uh, allows us to navigate using waypoints. Using these waypoints, we search and rescue uh, our map in a hallway. Uh, we go through these waypoints, and we use the Connect also to search for a victim. We're doing this, uh, we use the Connect to recognize color, to recognize this jacket, the, uh, the yellow on it. And uh, whenever it sees the yellow color, it goes towards the victim and goes right up to it and uh, says there's a victim there. And we check the CO2 emissions. And OK, so given the constraint of this project, such as three quarters to project completion, as well as a $500 budget, um, project planning and management was a big part of this. So we spent a lot of time and put a lot of emphasis on project planning and budget management. And we were able to finish on time with the search and rescue demo, meet all of our requirements, have um, and be under budget as well. Um, so we are currently completed with our project. It was a lot of fun, and we learned a lot along the way. Hello, this is Sheng Zhao, Chalik Sisman Turk, Dan Carball, and I'm Derek Folk. This is SAVED, or Sensors for Automated Vehicle Environment Detection. What this system is, is on a sunny day, if it happens to rain out, uh, what, a raindrop will hit this circuit. It'll connect the circuit. It'll send a pulse to our pick. It'll then shoot the, w the window right up. In contrast, we also have a thermistor on board to measure the ambient temperatures inside. What this will do is we can mo continuously monitor the temperature. And when it, the temperature inside the car reaches a dangerous level, we can crack the window to a user-defined uh, distance uh, with security in mind. Uh, to talk about the, some more hardware, here's Dan. <clears throat> Other hardware in our circuitry is uh, we have a PIC microcontroller that controls everything. Uh, we also have four relays, uh, and then we have a car battery for our other power source. And so the way that it works is when we sense rain or a hot temperature, then uh, the PIC will send a pulse to our four circuits, and they'll control these four relays, which will and then roll the windows up or roll the windows down. And here's Chalik Shishman. Hi, I'm Chalik Shishman Turk. I'm the software guy and your demo man. So let's say, for instance, it decides to rain. Your window will drive up, like so. And if it's hot, your window will go down, like so. And the way that works is I've written the code in assembly using MPLAB. Uh, it's pretty much what we're doing is sending pulses based on uh, information we receive from our sensors. Um, and that's saved. Thank you. Hello, we are the Collision Avoidance Team here at Ohio University. I'm Matthew Elliott. This is Zach Frazier. And we have Joseph Benedetto over here. And we also have one other team, men team member that is out of town. Uh, his name is Matt Downey. And we also have a, f a faculty project lead, Dr. Brian Riley. So over the past year, we've been working on an object detection system that, would, that could possibly be implemented into aircraft wingtips to alert pilots when their objects come into close proximity to other aircrafts or other objects. Uh, by doing this, we're hoping to increase pilot awareness, therefore increasing the safety of the passengers, all the flight crews involved as well. Um, I'm gonna have Joe here show a video real fast of the exact kind of collisions that we're trying to avoid. As you can see, the, the wingtip of the bigger plane hits the tail of the smaller one, knocking it all over the place, uh, creating a very scary situation for everyone involved. A collision similar to this would cost about $39,000, but when you factor in the downtime and lost revenue, it really turns out to be about $400,000. So I'm gonna have Joe and Zach uh, demo our prototype real fast for you guys. Okay, well, um, when you do the, the prototype here, we've got two sensors, and uh, basically the two sensors together um, relay information back to the laptop here, and it processes the data to get into X and Y coordinates um, of detection. As you can see, as Zach moves his hand here, um, these X, Y coordinates will change, and uh, basically then the, on the GUI up here, then it would be displayed in an X, Y coordinates up on the screen to the pilot, and then would alert him when you got close to the 
um, aircraft so that he would know if he needs to steer around the object, try to stop, or, and also then it would also tell him where it is and basically how big of a threat it is. Um, this would be displayed in the cockpit of the aircraft as uh, the pilot was taxiing and basically would have an audible alert and a visual alert, uh, as you can see here on the display. Um, basically, we used two sensors to uh, triangulate the distance so that the sensors, if, they, if the object wasn't right in front of the sensors, then uh, you still get an accurate distance uh, from the aircraft as opposed to having a line of how far it is away from the aircraft. Hi, my name is Stephen Griffith and I'm with the Saw State Lighting Team. This is Robert Brown and Daniel Shin. Our project was to uh, implement LED technology into the street lights on campus. LEDs are uh, very efficient. This light only puts out 77 watts of power compared to the metal highlights, which is 219 watts of power. This difference in wattage gives it its ability to save energy over the amount of time. Basically, our project was to implement the lights and make it cost less than or $1,000. We had to research companies and use software to show how the lights would spread on our campus. So in order to get the uh, spread, the comparison between the spread, we went out to uh, West Green and we went up to an LED uh, lamp and a metal halide lamp. And we took two foot intervals and measured the light intensity in a radial direction around those two lamps. We took that data and we went into Dialux, our software, and we made out campus green and west green in the software and we put metal halides and LEDs in Dialux. We then used false color display to get the light intensity around those lights and compare them uh, side by side and we found that LEDs and metal halides are about the same. There's a few differences but basically uh, they're fine to put on uh, the university um, campus. And here's Daniel Shen talk, to talk about the financial um, statement. And uh, we know that the metal highlight bulb is only 2,000 hours for lifetime, but the LED luminary can uh, use for 60,000 for a lifetime. And uh, by replacing the 508 retrofit light in all your campus, we can see or we can almost uh, reach to the break even after 87 months and we will be saving um, $600,000 in the next 15 years and we'll be saving 4.4 million kilowatt hour energy in the next 15 years. And by increasing the price of electricity and our saving will be increased. So with all this information we can see that with this light we can save a high university $600,000 in the next 15 years and 4.4 million kilowatt hours which will save money, time, and the environment. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adam Navlevy, and I'm one of the members on um, the Wire Leads Capstone Senior Design Team for Ohio University. Our project involved um, a quad rotor project where we were autonomously going to detect a power line, approach a power line, land on a power line, and then harvest energy from a power line. In order to accomplish this, we used uh, several tools. Uh, one, two of the main tools were the robotic operating system and OpenCV, a computer, computer vision library. Uh, some of the tools we used were uh, line extraction and depth perception, you see here. And uh, pretty much our, that allowed us to determine approximately how far we were from the power line and then safely approach the power line. Uh, we also had to de design a test environment for the project. Uh, Will Burkett will talk about this. Hey, I'm Will Burkett. So uh, to test and develop a lot of aspects of our project, we had to develop a test environment for the project. Um, so we developed a model power line which utilizes the uh, 120 volts that come out of a wall outlet and it uh, transforms it down to around 5 volts which uh, increases the current of the wire to around 22.5 amps to uh, provide uh, an optimal amount of magnetic field around the wire. Hi, my name is Cheng Yuan and I want to introduce how the aerodrome approach to the power line. There are three main steps in approaching. First, the power, uh, the aerodrome will rise up to have the same height as the power line, and uh, the main program will record this height. And the aerodrome will drop off a little bit in the second step uh, to create a height difference. And finally, the aerodrome will move, uh, flying forward and upward toward to the power line. In order to complete those process, we need to read some data from the uh, camera and the height sensor.
Hi, my name is Xiang. Actually, our group uh, about this landing part. Uh, for this landing algorithm, when the approaching process is finished, we actually start our landing. For this landing process, when the cell joint is very close to the wire, uh, uh, wire, we raise up a little bit and then move forward. When the hook is stuck on by the wire, it will rotate upside down, as you can see out here. And for this uh, hook design, uh, so far we have like several one, uh, several hook uh, design. But uh, finally, we choose the aluminum one, which is uh, both strong and uh, light. Will not affect the uh, flight uh, quality and also reach the stable landing. Hi, my name is Bradley Wright, and I'll talk about the um, <coughs> last phase of the wire leach project. So the last phase is the power harvesting part. And as Will mentioned earlier, um, we make use of the test environment that we built. So due to the nature of alternating current, it creates a magnetic field. And through this magnetic field, we were able to design a circuit that harvests this magnetic field um, to light this indicating LED. And originally, we had some problems. We were going to use a ferrite toroid to increase how much power we could harvest. But we ran into more problems with that. So we ended up just using a power amplifying circuit to use the signal that we gen that harvest from the magnetic field as an input to an amplifier circuit, which then was able to indicate that power transfer is occurring by lighting the LED. Wire Leach project was successful. Thanks. Hi, my name is Thomas, and this is Mac, and this is Ben, and we are the RoboCat team. And uh, this is our RoboCat, and uh, our goal is to build a four-lake uh, mechanical RoboCat and uh, to do the various tasks like rescue mission or reconnaissance. And my main task here is to build a touchpad and the, uh, with an Arduino board. And this one is a touchpad. It connects with the PC-104, which is the, our main processor here. And then uh, the touchpad is like uh, representing you petting the cat, and then you can send a comment. If, if you swipe one direction, you tell the cat to do something, and if you swipe a different direction, the cat will do something else. And uh, this is Arduino board, and this uh, is uh, taking all the signals and then send it to the cat. Hello, my name is Max Segro. Uh, my primary function in this uh, project was to do uh, mechanical changes and uh, fabrication and design work. Um, the first thing we did was to improve the knee joints so that there was no lateral uh, shift. Um, the next thing we did was look at anatomical models of cats found in nature, in which case we decided to add a flexible spine uh, using a spring steel core and, and wooden vertebrae. And then we added a uh, hawk joint like was found in nature. I'm Ben, and I'm in charge of the movement of the cat. Uh, what we've got is basically an upper level functioning computer right here called a PC-104. And that'll send commands to this microchip right here, which is controlling all these servo motors. And from there, we can get individual different positions for each leg. Uh, when you look at a regular cat, you notice a gait sequence of two feet up, two feet down. That's called a dynamic sequence. With our cat, we have a static sequence, which is three legs up, one leg down. Uh, this is improved stability and allows for more safety for the cat. That's it. We're the RoboCat team. Hi, I'm Robert Mash. This is Xian Chen Kong and this is the 2012 UFO Senior Capstone Design Project at Ohio University. It's a three-rotor hovercraft uh, with three main propellers in a triangular configuration as opposed to four main propellers in a rectangular configuration, which is typical for uh, the typical quadrotor hovercraft. We have uh, ducted fans in an outboard configuration, and they operate as a fourth degree of freedom actuator, which is required for stable flight. Also, uh, they provide a lot of forward thrust efficiently, so we can get up to speed quickly. I'm going to pass it off to Kong. Everything on the UFO except the airframe and the flight computer is bought from hobby remote control airplane market. Uh, the frame is built of carbon fiber rods glued together and the strips of carbon fiber cloth. Um, the onboard flight computer is called HiQ, and uh, it is uh, designed by uh, quantum engineer. It's easy to program, and the sensors, inputs, and the servo outputs are directly interfaced with it. The plan is to add a GPS and then program to perform uh, autonomous flight 
uh, along with along a predefined trajectory in the future. Presently, the UFO has about 12 pounds of vertical thrust, uh, but it only weighs 10 pounds. So, in the future, flight testing should be able to carry up to two pounds of payload. After we uh, complete a sequence of ground testing, a sequence of flight testing is planned. Those flights should last up to 10 minutes with the present battery capacity. In conclusion, the next version of UFO will be more uh, performance oriented. It should have a larger payload capability and a longer flight time and uh, maybe higher top speed.